on World News Tonight. Deadly storm. Cyclone Mokha makes landfall in Myanmar, causing millions to evacuate, while also causing devastation in neighboring countries. Breakthrough elections. Thailand's opposition obtains a landslide victory in the country's latest elections. What does this mean for the military-backed parties? More on this tonight. Finally, truce. Israel's military and the Palestinian Jihad agrees to an Egypt broker truce. But the question remains as to how long this will last. Peace in the blooms. Ukrainians in Kiev find temporary calm and peace with a lilac bloom season coming into effect. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and welcome to World News Tonight, where we bring to you the latest news from across the planet. Starting off this Monday evening, we take a look at the path of destruction caused by Cyclone Mokha. The tropical cyclone, which had been strengthening in the Bay of Bengal, has hit western Myanmar and Bangladesh's Cox Bazar, where around one million people live in flimsy shelters in what many consider to be the world's largest refugee camp. Cyclone Mokha is the first to form in the Bay this year and made landfall in western Myanmar's Rakhin state near the border with Bangladesh. Storm surges whipped up by a powerful cyclone inundated the Miyama port city of Sitwe on Sunday. Winds of up to 130 miles per hour ripped away tin roofs and brought down a communications tower. Parts of Sitwe, the capital of Miyama's Rakhine state, were flooded. Some 400,000 people were evacuated in the country and low-lying neighboring Bangladesh. Authorities and aid agencies are scrambling to avert heavy casualties from one of the strongest storms to hit the region in recent years. <laughs> Myanmar has been plunged into chaos since the junta seized power two years ago. After a crackdown on protests, a resistance movement is fighting the military on various fronts. Across Rakhine State and the northwest of the country, about 6 million people were already in need of humanitarian assistance. 1.2 million people have been displaced, according to the UN Humanitarian Office. In Bangladesh, authorities moved around 300,000 people to safer areas before the storm hit. Rohingya refugees inside densely populated camps in the Cox's Bazaar in the southeast of the country hunkered down inside their ramshackle homes. More than a million Rohingya refugees, half a million children among them, live in sprawling camps prone to flooding and landslides after having fled a military-led crackdown in Myanmar in 2017. Now over to Southeast Asia, Thailand's opposition secured a stunning election win after trouncing parties allied with the military, setting the stage for a flurry of deal-making over forming a government in a bid to end nearly a decade of conservative army-backed rule. To chants of Prime Minister and even fan art, the leader of Thailand's opposition Move Forward Party basked in a huge election win on Sunday. Voters turned out in force behind two parties promising big changes and an end to a decade of conservative government led or backed by the military. Move Forward's leader Peter Lim Jaranrat described the win as sensational. To be the manager of that coalition building is still uh, waited to be seen. His party came close to a clean sweep in Bangkok, riding a wave of support from young voters. It, along with the Pua Thai party, surged ahead with more than 90% of the votes counted. Despite what looked like clear results, forming government may be far less so. Parliamentary rules are skewed in the military's favor. They wrote them after the 2014 coup. So the next hurdle for the opposition parties will be to strike deals and win over members of a junta-appointed Senate, who also get a say on who becomes prime minister and forms government. The vote in Southeast Asia's second biggest economy marked the latest round in a long-running power battle between Puatai, the juggernaut of the billionaire Shinawat family, against a nexus of old money, conservatives and military with influence over key institutions involved in two decades of upheaval. Puatai has won five consecutive general elections since 2001, 
but has either been forced out of power or disqualified each time. But this stunning performance by Move Forward will likely test the resolve of the country's establishment and ruling parties. They're also a crushing blow for the military and its allies. The results appear to set Prime Minister Prayut chan cha up for a big defeat. The retired general who led the last coup slipped quietly away from his party headquarters on Sunday. He thanked the Thai people for voting while saying he respects democracy and the election. In more election news, Turkey headed off for a run of vote after President Tayyip Erdogan led over his opposition rival in the recent election but fell short of an outright majority to extend his 20-year rule of the NATO member country. Hours after polls closed on Sunday, Turkey appeared headed for a runoff presidential election, with rival parties both claiming the lead. But sources in camps of both incumbent President Tayyip Erdogan and challenger Kamal Kılıç Daroğlu admitted they may not clear the 50 percent threshold to win outright. Early results put Erdogan comfortably ahead, but as the count continued, his advantage slid. Sunday's vote is one of the most consequential elections in the country's 100-year history, a contest that could end Erdogan's 20-year rule and reverberate well beyond Turkey's borders. As one of President Vladimir Putin's closest allies, a defeat for Erdogan will likely unnerve the Kremlin but comfort the Biden administration, as well as many European and Middle Eastern leaders who had troubled relations with Erdogan. Turkey's longest-serving leader has turned the NATO member country of 85 million into a global player, modernized it through megaprojects, and built a military industry sought by foreign states. But his volatile economic policy of low interest rates set off a spiraling cost-of-living crisis and inflation, angering voters. His government's slow response to a devastating earthquake in southeast Turkey that killed 50,000 people added to voters' dismay. Kılıç Daroğlu has pledged to set Turkey on a new course by reviving democracy after years of state repression, returning to orthodox economic policies, empowering institutions who lost autonomy under Erdogan's tight grasp, and rebuilding ties with the West. If neither candidate secures 50 percent of Sunday's vote, the runoff election will be held May 28th. Now, over in Pakistan, Pakistan's ex-Prime Minister Imran Khan left court premises in Islamabad a day after the Supreme Court ruled his dramatic arrest on corruption charges was illegal. After his release, the former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan targeted the military in his first address since his release from custody and advised them to form their own political party. Freedom, that's what thousands of supporters chanted as they welcomed former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan home on Saturday at his residence in Lahore. A Pakistani court ordered Khan's release on bail for two weeks, according to his lawyers on Friday. He departed the court premises and headed towards his hometown. He had remained inside for hours after being granted bail, saying he was not being allowed to leave by security officials. Khan was arrested on Tuesday by the anti-graft agency in a land fraud case. The arrest was ruled by the Supreme Court invalid and unlawful on Thursday. Khan's arrest ignited deadly protests in many cities and a tussle with the military. Khan welcomed the court's order and told reporters inside the court premises the judiciary was Pakistan's only protection against the, quote, law of the jungle. Khan added that he did not believe the country's security agencies were against him, but he suggested that the position of the army chief was all-powerful. The army's public relations wing did not immediately respond to his request for comment. Khan's critics once accused him of being maneuvered into power in 2018 by the powerful military, a charge both sides denied. But he later fell out with the generals, accusing them of plotting his removal from power in 2022. He has since been a vocal critic of current army chief general Asim Munir. Khan is Pakistan's most popular leader 
according to opinion polls. Israel and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad group in Gaza have agreed to a truce that has officially been in effect. Palestinian officials have said signaling an end to the worst episode of cross-border fire since a 10-day war in 2021. Palestinians took to the streets in Gaza City Saturday evening as a ceasefire between Israel and the militant Islamic Jihad went into effect, signaling an end to the worst episode of cross-border fire since a 10-day war in 2021. Egypt, which brokered the ceasefire, called on all sides to adhere to the agreement. Islamic Jihad and Israeli officials confirmed a truce had been reached. Even as the truce was being finalized, the two sides kept up firing with air raids sounding. Israel launched the latest round of airstrikes in the early hours of Tuesday, announcing that it was targeting Islamic Jihad commanders who had planned attacks in Israel. In response, the Iranian-backed group fired more than 1,000 rockets, sending Israelis fleeing into bomb shelters. During the five days of the campaign, Israel killed six senior Islamic Jihad commanders and destroyed a number of military installations. But at least 10 civilians, including women and children, were also killed in Gaza during the fighting, and two people, an Israeli woman and a Palestinian laborer, were killed by Palestinian rocket fire in Israel. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. After marking his first year in office last week, South Korean President Yoon suk yeol heads into a full week of summits. The G7 meeting and the trilateral talks with Japan and the US are key engagements on his calendar. President Yoon suk yeol will hold a trilateral meeting with his Japanese and US counterparts this weekend on the sidelines of the G7 summit in Hiroshima. Yoon's office has confirmed that the president will head to Hiroshima on Friday and attend an expanded session of G7 member countries plus eight guest nations including South Korea. He will share South Korea's position on the key topics of food security, energy supplies amid the Ukraine war, climate change and ways to bridge the gap between the G7 and the global south. Invited by Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, Yoon's attendance marks a further step to improve bilateral ties, as the two neighbouring countries aim to end their trade and diplomatic disputes that worsened in 2019. During Yoon's three-day visit, the two leaders will make an unprecedented joint visit to a memorial honouring Korean victims of the atomic bomb that devastated Hiroshima in 1945. To boost joint efforts with the US to address North Korea's nuclear threat and cooperate on strategic areas, Yoon and Kushida will also meet with Joe Biden. While there won't be a joint declaration, the three-way summit will be a meaningful follow-up to their previous dialogue in Cambodia last November, according to Deputy National Security Advisor Kim tae Building on President Yoon's U.S. state visit to mark the 70th year of the South Korea-U.S. alliance and the resumption of shuttle diplomacy between Korea and Japan, we will further map out our role and contribution in multilateral diplomacy such as at the G7 in Hiroshima. Kim says Yoon is likely to hold bilateral meetings with other world leaders while he's in Hiroshima as part of his week-long streak of diplomacy that begins before he heads to the G7 meeting. This Wednesday, President Yoon will hold a bilateral meeting in Seoul with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau upon the 60th anniversary of South Korea-Canada relations. The summit will be followed by a joint press conference and an official banquet. Another key bilateral is scheduled for Sunday. As soon as Yoon returns from Hiroshima, he will meet with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who also heads to Seoul after the G7 meeting. The next day, Yoon will sit down with European Council President Charles Michel and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen to discuss how to further their 60 years of bilateral relations, focusing on digital partnership and the green transition. As Yoon begins his second year in office, Kim tae said Seoul's foreign policy will focus on maximizing South Korea's economic and security interests and pursue pragmatic diplomacy, while strengthening global solidarity on the principle of freedom. 
Now, on the economic front, South Korea's exports continue to struggle amid the global economic slowdown, which its key chip sector among the hardest hit. This, according to experts, could have severe repercussions around the world, especially in industries that depend on the undisrupted inflow of South Korean microchips. South Korea's ICT industry recorded a trade surplus of 2.33 billion US dollars despite exports falling across all major sectors and trading partners. According to data released on Monday by the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy, the total value of tech exports in April came to around $12.8 billion, nearly 36% lower than the same month last year. The ministry attributed this to April last year recording the highest value of ICT exports for the month of April, while the ICT industry this year has seen lower demand due to the downturn of the global economy. By sector, there was a 40.5% decline on year in the total export value of semiconductors, marking the ninth consecutive month in which chip exports have fallen on year. The continued decline comes on the back of falling prices for memory chips such as DRAM, which have seen price drops for 10 months in a row due to lack of demand. Exports for displays such as OLED screens used in phones fell by 30.5% on year, and exports of mobile phones, computers and telecommunication devices also fell on year. By country, China is the destination for 40% of South Korea's ICT exports. But this year, tech exports to China have fallen by nearly 40% on year. There's been a steady decline in tech exports to China on year since June last year. Outbound shipments to the United States also fell by more than 40%, while exports to Vietnam, the European Union and Japan also dropped by more than 25% on year. South Korea's ICT trade balance has generally recorded a surplus, but ICT imports have been rising over the past few years. April saw a more than 22% on-year rise in imports from India, but there was a sharp decline in imports from the United Arab Emirates. Now for updates on the war in Ukraine, Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky vowed to reclaim his entire country while on his first visit to Germany since Russia attacked Ukraine last year. A trip that signaled that the tense relation between Kiev and its biggest military and financial backer in Europe are thawing. A warm handshake from German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, then military honors greeted Vladimir Zelensky Sunday in Berlin. On his first trip to Germany since the war in Ukraine began, the Ukrainian president received assurances of German support. I have said it many times and I repeat it here today. We will support you as long as needed. Zelensky's arrival in Germany comes a day after Berlin announced a new massive package of military aid for Kyiv. Worth 2.7 billion euros, it includes 30 more Leopard tanks, 100 armored combat vehicles and some 200 surveillance drones. The move is the strongest signal yet of Germany's support of Ukraine. After a year of choppy relations and hesitancy from Berlin, Germany is now one of Ukraine's largest military backers. Zelensky's visit is part of an effort to rally support from European allies ahead of a planned counteroffensive against Moscow. Speaking to reporters in Berlin, he denied accusations from Russia that Kyiv was striking targets within Russian territory. We are not interested in attacking Russian territory. We don't have time for this. We don't have the resources for this. We don't have surplus weapons for this. We are focused on preparing our counteroffensive. On Saturday, Zelensky visited Italy, where he received words of support from the Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney. And at the Vatican, he met with Pope Francis, where he discussed the fate of tens of thousands of children that Kiev says were deported to Russia. Over in the United States, migrant crossings at the U.S.-Mexico border have unexpectedly fallen and not risen since Title 42 curbs expired, after which the Biden administration said that reinstating criminal penalties for illegal entity is likely the biggest reason for this drop. Tonight, tales of pain and suffering along the U.S.-Mexico border. Not only have we been planning, but we have been executing on those plans. Migrants must first secure appointments on an app before entering a port of entry. 
Those that cross illegally could be barred from seeking asylum for five years. As migrants are shipped north, a humanitarian crisis is brewing in sanctuary cities across the country. In New York, the historic Roosevelt Hotel in Midtown Manhattan is being transformed into an asylum seeker arrival center. In Chicago, warehouses are preparing to house migrants. And in Denver, this parking lot served as a makeshift shelter. Bells ringing and flowers being given out on the border today. A moment to celebrate the mothers. As this mother is left wondering why her 17-year-old son died in U.S. immigration custody earlier this week. Él iba sano, él iba bien. He was healthy and doing well, she says. Families in search of a better life, now caught in the middle of policy and politics. Welcome back. For more news, let's take care of the world in a minute. At least 676 people have been killed due to the clashes between the Sudanese army and the rapid support forces, according to a report of the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. One of Australia's most unique and iconic species, the platypus, was reintroduced into the country's oldest national park just south of Sydney in a landmark conservation project after disappearing from the area around half a century. Canada's main oil-producing province of Alberta faces an upsurge in wildfire activity as Western Canada continues to swelter in hot, dry weather and blazes keep thousands from their homes. Authorities said they had already seen an increase in fire activity and were expecting more. Novak Djokovic continued his Italian Open title defence with a victory over Bulgarian 26th seed Grigor Dimitrov. Djokovic overcame a sluggish start and a late comeback attempt by familiar opponent Dimitrov to get over the line in that third round meeting. VR46 Racing's Marco Bezzecchi produced a battling display at the French GP to record his second win of the season and slash fellow Italian Francesco Bagnia's championship lead. Four seconds behind the week. That is all from us here at World News tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We end tonight's broadcast with a visit to war-torn cave where residents are given a temporary spike to war with blooming lilacs. Thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your evening.